It's been a while since we tackled any Pico content on the channel, so I thought it was time to fix that. And, when Sunfounder reached out to ask if I'd like them to send me their new Thales Pico starter kit, it seemed like the perfect opportunity. But, rather than do just a regular unboxing where I tell you what's included in the kit, I thought it would be fun to set up three of their included projects and explain how the code works and test them out. So, if you're ready for three more easy projects that anyone can tackle using the Raspberry Pi Pico, stick around. Because that's just what we're going to do here today on Print and Play. If you want more Pico content, make sure to click the thumbs up to let me know. And if you're new here, make sure to subscribe. I've got all sorts of Pi, Pico, Arduino, and 3D printing projects on the way, and you're not going to want to miss any of them. But before we start any of the projects, let's go ahead and seat our Pico in the breadboard, making sure that we put pin 1 to pin 1. It'll make wiring a lot easier down the road. Next, we'll get ground from going into the third pin on the top of the Pico. And we'll get power from pin 5. Now we're ready to jump into our first project. So I thought I'd start off with one of the easier projects, but one that teaches us an important programming idea. So this game is a reaction timing game. And what happens is the LED is lit at the beginning, and when it goes out, you press the button as quickly as you can. And it will tell you how long it took you to press the button to give you your reaction time. The important concept introduced during this is the idea of an interrupt. So interrupts are used to interrupt whatever is currently going on and execute code immediately. So if you have a loop that's running and there's some code executing during that and you want something to happen when a button is triggered, you can program an interrupt. That way, when the button is pressed, no matter what your code is doing, it will immediately execute the code for that button press before going back to what it was doing. For this project, we'll need a couple of resistors, an LED of a color of your choosing, a button, and some jumper cables. And we'll go ahead and get it wired up as this diagram shows. We'll go ahead and place our jumper pin from GP14 out into the board. This will be used for our button press. Next, we'll extend GP15 out further, and this will be used to power the LED. We'll take our resistor and place it from the pin we just placed, and we'll go out a little bit further, and this will prevent the LED from burning itself out. Next, on the other side of the bridge, but directly lined up with it, we're going to go ahead and connect our ground up. Then we go ahead and place our LED in with the long pin, or the positive side pin, facing down towards our resistor. Next, going directly across from the first wire for our switch, we'll go ahead and place the resistor, connecting it to ground. So this is a pull-down resistor to ensure that the button always reads zero except for when the button is pressed, since without a pull-down resistor it can be floating. Coming over, not directly next to, but one after that from that resistor, we'll go ahead and place a cable to connect to power. And finally, we can install our button, ensuring that the pins line up with the wires we've put in. And after taking a closer look, the wire to connect GP14 to the switch was off by one, so I've gone ahead and moved it over, so now everything is connected up properly. And with our wiring complete, now it's time to take a look at the code. So before we walk through the code, let's go ahead and give it a test and see what happens. So the LED illuminates, and now we're just waiting for it to go off before we press the button as quickly as we can. And my reaction time was 272 milliseconds. So what's the code doing? Well, we start by importing some stuff, U time for tracking time, and U random for generating random numbers. We create an LED variable connected to pin 15 as an output pin, and we create a button variable connected to pin 14 as an input pin. Here's the subroutine that handles the interrupt, and basically all it does is when the button is pressed, it does a calculation based on the time that the light went off and the time you press the button, and delivers a message saying how long it took you to do that. 
As the code executes, we turn the LED on. We sleep for a random amount of time between 5 and 10 seconds. Then the LED goes off, and we capture at which time, according to the system clock, the LED was turned off. We then connect our button press to the interrupt, and now it's just a matter of you pushing the button. So rather than having to have a loop running constantly, checking to see if the button's been pressed, instead, code gets executed when the button is pressed, which is way more efficient for the CPU. For the next example, we'll be learning how to control addressable LEDs using our Pico. Now, keep in mind, the Pico can control any number of LEDs, it can control hundreds of them, but we are limited, in this case, to the amount of power that the USB port on the Pico can provide. So we're going to go with 8. If you want to go above 8 or 10, you're going to want to have a separate power supply just for your LEDs. On our LEDs, we have power and ground, and we also have a data line. So how this works is almost like passing a note. So the Pico says, for example, I want to turn on LED 6 to the color blue. So it sends the signal out through the data line. LED 1 gets it and says, I'm the first LED to get this, or count 1, and it's meant for 6, so I'm not going to do anything. So it adds 1 to it and passes it along. So now the number's up to 2, and LED 2 says, oh, this isn't for me, and it keeps passing along until finally it gets to LED 6, and it says, oh, well, I'm the sixth LED to get this, and this is meant for LED 6, so I'm going to turn on to blue. So we can go ahead and wire these LEDs according to this diagram. So go ahead and take power from the 5 volt rail up at the top left. Our ground can just go into any of the ground pins. And finally, our data is coming off of pin 1 on the bottom left. Okay, so before we're able to actually run any of the code to control the LEDs, we're going to have to import the library to do that. And that's the WS2812 library. So we'll go ahead and copy and paste the contents of the library into our IDE, and then we'll click File, and Save As, and it'll prompt you to save to the computer or to the Pico, and we'll save to the Pico. Next, we'll put in the library name, ws2812.py, and click OK. And now the library is available to our Pico, and we can run our custom code. And the code is pretty simple. So we import the library that we just saved to the Pico, then we create an instance of the WS2812 object, passing it pin 0 from the Pico to control the LEDs, and then it's just a matter of using an index, which is the number between these two square brackets, to tell each LED what to do. From there you can pass it a red, green, and blue value, and set the colors. So as you can see, none of the colors on these LEDs should be the same, and if we execute it, we in fact get blue, purple, green, red, another shade of blue, another shade of green, a white, and an orange. But what if we wanted to manipulate it some more? Well, we could write a loop that causes a light to scroll across the eight LEDs instead of leaving all eight turned on. So I imported sleep from time, and then I created a loop. So if the loop is on zero, then turn off LED seven and turn on LED zero. Otherwise, every time you go through, you're going to turn on the LED that corresponds to the current count of your loop and turn off the one that was on previously, which is loop count minus one. Then we write that out to the LED strip and in increment the loop count by one. When it hits eight, we set it to zero and we sleep for half a second. And what does the code look like? Well, in execution, we can see that it turned on the LEDs like last time. Then it turns them off and pulses a blue LED across the strip endlessly. So you could definitely use this in conjunction with the code for the reaction game from the first example to create an even more fun game where, say, the dot was going back and forth and you had to try and get it onto one of the specific LEDs. All right, well, let's move on to example three. This last project allows us to build a rudimentary theremin, which is a musical instrument using our Pico, a speaker, and a photoresistor as well as a transistor. So I've gone ahead and wired it up as it shows in this diagram. Now this one got a little complicated in terms of the wiring and it was hard to show, so I figured I'd walk you through it instead. So first, off of pin 28, which supports analog to digital, we've got that connected to one pin on the photoresistor. We also have a resistor, which is a 10K resistor, going from positive power to that same pin. 
and the opposite side of that photoresistor is connected to ground. We also have an LED that is meant to give us status. So pin 16 from the GPIO goes to this 220 ohm resistor, which then goes into the positive pin on the LED. And of course, the other side is connected to our ground. Next, we have an S8050 transistor and of course our speaker. The speaker is connected on the positive side to our power rail. The negative pin on our speaker is connected to the collector pin on our transistor. The middle pin or base pin is connected via a 1K resistor to GP15. And finally, the final pin, the emitter pin, is connected to ground. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the code and fire this up. And I will warn you, the sound isn't the most pleasant thing in the world. Um, I'll try and tone it down a little bit in editing and I won't let it run too long, but it isn't as fantastic as you might hope. So the basic concept behind this is that the photoresistor changes the amount of resistance it's giving based on the amount of light that's hitting the collector. So if you were to cover it up, the resistance value changes and as more light is exposed, it changes again. So then you can change the resistance value just by moving your hand closer and further away from the photoresistor, which you can then use to change the pitch on the speaker. So as you move your hand closer or further away, the pitch goes up and down. So let's take a look and see how it's doing it in code. Well, we start off defining variables for our LED, our photoresistor, which is connected to the analog to digital converter on pin 28, and our buzzer. It starts off with a low value of 65535 and a high value of zero. We have an internal mapping that converts our value from the photoresistor into an audible tone, and then we have a tone function that actually plays that tone over the speaker. So when we start up the code, it records the starting time, and it sets the LED to one. Then it sleeps for one second, and then it does a process. So over the course of five seconds, it records highs and lows. So if the current value it just read is greater than the high value, well, that becomes the new high value. And if it's lower than the low value, well, that becomes the low value. Once that's done, it turns off the LED to let you know its configuration is done. And then it starts reading the code and turning it into a pitch. So you can see here, it reads the value from the photoresistor and then it uses that internal mapping value to convert it into a pitch. If the pitch is greater than 50, it goes ahead and plays the tone, sleeps for 10 milliseconds before running again, and it prints out the light value to console. So let's go ahead and execute it and see how it works in practice. So I'm reconnecting to the Pico and I'll go ahead and run the code. And during that first five seconds, I just wanna pass my hand over the resistor so that it gets the values. And as you can see, as I move my hand back and forth over it, the pitch of the note changes. So with a little practice, you could potentially learn how to play a rudimentary song. There are so many ways you can combine the code and libraries offered by these tutorials to make even more fun projects, and I can't wait to see what you guys do with it. Well, that's it for this one, but until next time, stay creative.